Hi, I'm Lisa, and this is Threshold in China. Today, we are going to share some exciting tech innovations and announcements that happened in China recently. Huawei recently released a new smartphone, and people are curious about the source of the chip. While Huawei did not specify the chip technology used in the phone, Tech Insight, a Canadian semiconductor firm, took the phone apart and suggested that the chip is in fact the Kilin 9000S. It is manufactured using advanced 7 nanometer process technology. This new domestically made chip is hailed as a victory by Chinese as it defies US sanctions. Up until now, the best chip manufacturers in China had only publicly reported the mass production of 28 nanometers chips. So, how did Huawei suddenly jump to 7 nanometers? In 2022, Tech Insight also disassembled a crypto mining ASIC from Minerva, a fabulous crypto mining semiconductor company. They found that the Minerva Bitcoin miner system on chip was manufactured by SMIC and the parameter is very close to TSMC and Samsung's first generation 7 nanometer process. This suggests three things. First, Chinese chip enterprises have acquired 7 nanometer production capabilities. Second, if it's being used in mining machines, it means these chips have industrial patch delivery capabilities and not just a few experimental products from a laboratory. And third, the manufacturing time of these chips can be traced back to July 2021, indicating that the breakthrough to 7 nanometers in China happened as early as 2021. But from a global perspective, the 7 nanometer technology still lags behind the cutting edge process currently used for smartphone chips. For example, the iPhone 15 uses 3 nanometer process. According to Professor Liu Tingjie, the gap is 2 to 2.5 nodes, which means that Huawei's 5G chips are 3 to 5 years behind the forefront. However, given the rapid progress of China's semiconductor industry, the gap could be closed sooner. More importantly, reports suggest Mix 60 Pro sales have exceeded 800,000 units, with supply chain orders reaching 15 to 17 million. This high volume speaks to a stable supply of the 5G chips. For these production numbers to be achieved, Huawei and other manufacturers throughout its supply chain must have achieved major improvement in advanced process and effectively managing the yield rates of chip wafers, or else the cost of making a smartphone would be too high. Another interesting feature of the Mate 60 Pro is that it realizes direct satellite calls. By connecting to China's high-orbit Tiantong-1 communication satellite, the phone unlocks satellite calling beyond just sending short messages, something that was previously only possible with large antennas and high transmission power. Huawei making a comeback has definitely raised questions on the effectiveness of sanctions, and experts suggest that US may impose even greater restrictions than would exist today to further curtail China's access to critical manufacturing technologies. Recently, U.S. Commerce Secretary Raimondo announced U.S. will not be selling advanced chips to China with an intent to restrict the development of China's AI sector and limit end-to-end -end companies like Huawei from controlling communication endpoints. But for now, it seems that U.S. chipmakers were right when they warned that extensive sanctions would not stop China, but in fact motivate it to redouble its effort to build alternative to U.S. technologies a phenomenon that is also happening to other sectors as the tech wave intensifies. China and the United States have both announced major breakthroughs in stimulating nuclear fusion reactions of the sun. Recently, China's new generation artificial sun Huanliu-3 achieved a high confinement mode operation with a plasma current of a staggering 1 million amperes, the highest current ever for nuclear fusion. The Huanliu-3 device a tokamak using magnetic field to trap and squeeze a plasma of fusion fuel, creating temperatures about seven times hotter than the core of the sun. At these scorching temperatures, the repulsive force between nuclei are overcome, leading to nuclear fusion. This breakthrough makes the entire system more controllable and cost-effective, thus promoting the commercialization of nuclear fusion. 
In late 2022, the United States National Ignition Facility (NIF), renowned for its massive laser system, also accomplished the groundbreaking first ever ignition in history. This achievement signified the fusion reactions becoming a self-sustained engine, producing enough energy to maintain themselves and compensate for any energy loss, comparable to harness a star's energy. NIF used high-intensity lasers to superheat and squeeze a tiny fusion fuel pellet, inducing a short-lived but powerful burst of fusion reactions. Although using dramatically different approaches, both of these breakthroughs bring us closer to a future of unlimited energy possibilities. The two main techniques to achieve this are magnetic confinement and inertial confinement. Both methods use hydrogen isotope as fuel. When these isotopes fuse together, they form helium and release a tremendous amount of energy in the form of heat and neutrons. Magnetic confinement aims for a steady-state fusion reaction, which means using strong magnetic field to contain hot plasma so the fusion reaction can occur continuously, providing a stable and consistent power output. This allows steady power production as a conventional power plant. However, the complexity and the large scale of the device required to maintain the plasma present cost and operational challenges. Issues such as plasma instabilities, turbulence, and heat losses become more pronounced as the current increases, approaching the threshold of ignition. What is significant with Huan Liu Three is that it allows plasma currents of one million amperes while maintaining stability. This high current brings scientists closer to achieve ignition and produce a net output of energy. Projects like Wan Liu Three, as well as the International ITER project in France, in which China also participates, are making substantial progress in the field, aiming to make fusion a large-scale energy source. Inertial confinement, on the other hand, aims for a pulse fusion reaction. It rapidly compresses a small pellet of fusion fuel using focused laser beam or particle beams. This causes a burst of fusion reaction, like a tiny explosion, for a very brief moment. This produces fusion in short pulses, offering flexibility in power generation and not in continuous power. However, it requires precision and synchronized laser pulses to compress the fuel pellet. When it comes to nuclear fusion power generation, it often seems like we are always 50 years away. However, recent research suggests that we probably don't have to wait that long. Developing a fusion reactor with clean, abundant energy with minimal environmental impact and no long-term radioactive waste is within our reach. Scientists anticipate that commercialization of nuclear fusion could be achieved by the mid 21st century, around 2050. Today, there are over 8 billion people on the planet. Our irresponsible actions caused the extinction of many animals. But did you know that we were once on the brink of extinction? And it is no less dramatic than the Cretaceous extinction event. In a study published in late August, Chinese scientists have shed light on the darkest chapter of human ancestral history. Utilizing a newly developed genomic model, they have revealed that during a prolonged period spanning over a hundred thousand years, the number of fertile individuals on Earth fell to a mere a thousand two hundred and eighty, bringing our ancestors dangerously close to extinction. Our understanding of population history has been constrained to the most recent three hundred thousand to a hundred thousand years, due to the constraints of ancient DNA sequence technology and the Earth's climate, which hinders DNA preservation in fossils older than three hundred thousand years. To overcome that, scientists have applied innovative population genetic theories to decode the historical imprint left by our ancestors in our genomes. The co-ancestry rate, a measure of genetic relatedness or shared ancestry between individuals or populations in each generation, is influenced by the effective population size of prehistorical times. By examining these genetic imprints, researchers can infer the population size of our ancestors. But the signal preserved in our genome becomes weaker the further back in time they go. To combat this, researchers from the Shanghai Institute of Nutrition and Health have pioneered a new theoretical approach, FitCall. 
It gave us a new way to estimate the likelihood of observing a specific pattern of gene mutations in a group of individuals, which tells us about their shared history. So essentially, FitCall can take a census of ancient human population. The study involves the analysis of genomic sequence from 3,154 modern individuals. It reveals a long and brutal bottleneck period spanning from 930,000 to 813,000 years ago. During this time, 98.7% of human ancestors vanished, leaving an average adult population size of around 1,280 for the subsequent 117,000 years. Human beings were on the verge of extinction, and the real situation may have included some natural fluctuations, making the risk of ancestral human extinctions even higher than the literal interpretation suggests. As a consequence of this small population, human genetic diversity has decreased by 65.85%. So what exactly happened? It is highly likely that they faced ice ages and severe droughts, the violent climate change of the early middle Pleistocene transition. Surviving all of these, our ancestors preserved. And according to the sequence results of African populations, after the bottleneck period, the ancient human population rapidly rebounded, increasing 20-fold. This could be attributed to both improved climate and learning how to make fires. The implications of this study go far beyond the realm of science and reach into the history of our common humanity. And that is all for today's threshold. As always, please let us know if you like this new section on science and technology in China, and we will do more in the future.